Pastor Tim, welcome to Revival for Mission. Thank you. So glad to be here and to join you both. So growing up, um, my parents struggled financially. They struggled with their jobs. They had no real career. Um, and as a result of that, the stress between their relationships were really poor. Uh, they would separate a number of times. So we did a lot of moving uh, from place to place, town to town, um, in and out of schools. Um, there were a number of times that uh, they couldn't afford the rent, so we'd end up moving with, with some friends or sometimes with some family. Uh, it was a very, very kind of chaotic uh, unstable upbringing. It reached a cu climax when I was 17 and my parents finally divorced um, and my, my mother moved far away. Uh, my stepfather stayed close and I had to choose whether I was going to be with my mom or my stepdad, uh, because I didn't want to leave my friends. I didn't want to move again. I was kind of in my mind all done moving. I, I chose to stay with my stepfather, who I didn't get along with very well. And um, uh, unfortunately, our relationship was horrible. And we got in this huge fight. And the fight ended with his words, if you don't like it, you can leave. And I left. I was like, I walked out. I'm like, I'm out of here. And Where did you go? Well, I thought I had a number of friends. I thought I could stay with my friends. So I just started asking my friends if I could stay with them, if I can, you know, live with them. And they're all like, no, 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 no. And finally, this one kid, Andy, is like, Tim, my, I'd love to let you stay with me. My parents won't let me. But my mom will let you stay in my backyard. Mm. So I set up my tent and lived in Andy's backyard. And I would go to school each day. I would shower after gym class, I would eat my lunch because we poor. I was part of a free hot lunch program. So I had one meal a day, showered at school. I was homeless, living in Andy's backyard. I wasn't allowed in the house. Um, so I slept in my tent, in my sleeping bag, went to school, was involved in extracurricular activities. At the end of the day, I was back in the backyard, sleeping there, hoping that there would be some way that I could kind of get out of this this mess. Bobby, before we get, get moving on to something really spectacular that seemed to happen in your life, tell us a little more. I mean, being homeless, okay, at least you were in a backyard, but you were on your own. How did you really survive on a daily basis? I mean, it's great you were able to take a shower at the school and all that kind of thing, but I mean, you, you only had one meal a day or whatever you could scrounge around. I mean, tell us a little more about that. Yeah. That's, that's a really tough situation. It was. And I was hoping I was going to be able to get a job and maybe get in my own apartment or something like that. But in the meantime, it was a, a survival mode. Growing up, we kind of learned to live with little. So that kind of went into that survival mode. I was very grateful that... Um, I was part of this hot lunch program so that every day I get a, a hot meal at school. And I remember going and, you know, going down the line and the lunch lady giving me food. And, I, and she gave me extra. I never asked for extra, uh, but she gave me extra. I don't know if she knew my situation or yeah. if she could tell that I was getting thinner or, or what it was. Or but the she Lord would, impressed her. Yeah, something. I, I, I didn't know what it was, but I remember she would give me extra. Of course, I would thank her so much for that. So I don't know if she... You know, just a smart lady. She probably knew um, who needed a little more. Um, but that was my one meal a day. You know, if friends had a little extra something, they might give me fine. Um, and, and, you know, I would, I would um, uh, shower at school. I was in the gym class, so I would clean myself every day. Um, I would sneak back into my stepdad's apartment complex and do laundry um, there uh, to try to keep my clothes clean. But it was very survivalist, minimalist lifestyle. It was not a lot of extras, you know. So I'd gone to all my friends in school and asked them, can I stay with you? Can I at least stay for a couple of weeks until spring break? You know, or as, as the, the, the time was going down, you know, a month, three weeks, you know, a couple of weeks, et cetera, until spring break because I was going to go stay with my mom. Maybe she and I could reconcile and work things out so I could stay with her. Um, and so I went to all my friends and um, all my close friends. I was in, in choir class. There was this, this other kid also in high school named Preston. And he came up to me one day. He's like, Tim, did I hear it right that you're, you're homeless? I'm like, well, yeah, I'm actually living in Andy's backyard in my tent. And he's like, well, do you need a place to stay? 
I said, yeah, I would love at least for two weeks until spring break so I can go see my mom. And that would be great. And he's like, well, let me call my parents. So we went down actually to the office. We got on the phone. He's talking to his mom on the phone. He's like, mom, I've got this friend. Uh, his name is Tim. He's you know, living in, in, in somebody's backyard in his tent. He needs a place to stay. Can we help him? And I'm, I'm standing there as he's having this conversation in the counseling center in mm. the school, school office. And, and I can hear her say, well, let's talk to your dad when he gets home. Is he safe? Is he going to be okay tonight? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, he'll be okay. You know, he's staying in a tent. But, you know, well, we'll talk about it tonight when your dad gets home from work. And so they, that night they talked about it and they invited me to come and stay with them for, for a couple of weeks until spring break came. I went to go spend that spring break with my mom. It was not going to work out for me to be able to stay with mm. her. She could hardly take care of herself at the time, let alone me. Mm. Um, she was trying to get her life stabilized. So I came back and went right back to my tent moved right into my tent. Um, this friend, uh, a few days later, uh, came to me and was like, you still need help? I'm like, yeah. So they ended up inviting me into their home through a series of events. They just, like, uh, unofficially, not official documents, adopted me as part of their family. So wow. this friend, Preston, uh, became known as, like, my brother. Uh, his sister, Karina, became my sister. Uh, you know, Dad Joe became Dad. You know, uh, Mom Adele became Mom. It was Mom, Dad, and my brother and my sister. And uh, they were Seventh-day Adventist family. And um, they, they had, had uh, the children in public school because they couldn't afford... Um, paying for the, the advanced education, so they temporarily pulled their kids out of school. And this friend Preston had been grown up his entire life saying, you know, if somebody's in a need and you have the ability to meet that need, we should do that. And so when he saw there was a need, their family reached out and I ended up moving in, started going to church with them, gave my life to Christ, and uh, completely changed the course of my life. I came to find out kind of how that conversation went that night, probably uh, two years later. I kind of got the behind the scenes as to what all happened. You know, at the dinner table that night when dad came home and they sat down and they talked about it. Uh, dad was a little resistant. I mean, he knew, just as you said, they'd been preaching, love others, love others, and now here's a chance to love somebody, and now it's becoming a bit real. They ended up calling some other friends in the church and prayed together. They ended up calling the pastor. The pastor came over, met with them, counseled with them. And the pastor ended up having the conversation and said, is it about money? Is it about your, uh, you know, feeling unsafe that here's this teenage boy with this middle school daughter in your home? Or is it that you're just not sure how this thing's going to turn out? And he's like, I just don't know how this is going to turn out. I don't feel like I'll be in control of this. And he's like, well, then that's where you need to trust God with this. And so they took this step of faith and invited me in their home in this temporary basis. And, you know, it's a two-week commitment, you know, kind of a thing. And then after that, they realized you know, we, we do want to be able to reach him beyond that. And there... Now, they're not a perfect family, right? Well, none of us have perfect families. There was mistakes. There was, you know, issues of family that you deal with, you know, sibling rivalries and dealing with rebellion of, of us teenagers and trying to live our lives the way we want to. I mean, it's life. But I saw unconditional love. Hmm. I saw something in that family that I had not seen in my own family. And I had seen, we'd gone to church when I was young. But we'd stopped going to church by the time I'd gotten to middle school. And I don't know why. Maybe it's because we were moving around and we just stopped going to church. But I saw here was a family that went to church, had daily worship. They prayed together as a family. They loved each other despite their difficulties. They accepted each other despite their differences. And they were willing to show me this crazy, worldly teenage boy God's unconditional love. And that, I said, I want this. I want what they have. I want, they have something, I don't have it in my life and I want it. And when I found out, you know, that it was Christ, that it was God, a relationship with him, I started Bible studies. And by that next year, I was baptized and completely changed, you know, my life. By the Praise time I graduated Lord. high school, I knew I wanted to be a pastor. And I remember we joke about it, but I would think in my mind, there's no way I could be a pastor. I mean, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm still viewing my life as this worldly teenage boy. You know, pastors are perfect you know, people who have their lives together and don't have problems. You know, I have that picture in my mind. Um, and, and there were others in the church, other leaders, youth leaders, elders in the church, pastor who would come and affirm in me and say, Tim, have you thought about, you know, becoming a pastor? 
no, not me, you know. And they, they affirmed me. Eventually, I remember there was an elders meeting that I was invited to. And I sat down in the meeting, the elders in a big circle, and they were all there to say, we want you to know that we feel you are called to the ministry. Wow. That's incredible. And that really, I was like, oh, okay, I, I guess I can, I can do this. And, <clears throat> and, um, and I haven't looked back. Sure. Before I graduated, I decided that I was going to be a pastor. And then freshman year, graduated from high school, freshman year in, in uh, college, went to Weimar College, and just didn't look back. Yeah, I got a summer job working at the high school, getting... Um, 17 bucks an hour, twice minimum wage, which was pretty good at the time. Sure. Um, saved every penny up throughout the summer. And a few other families in the church who, who wanted to help. And so I got some financial assistance from them. So I was able to, for the most part, work my way through college with a little bit of help from others who saw something in me. Every person that I see, regardless of their situation, whether they have a great influence, authority, and finances, or whether they have like I had nothing, they're a child of God that deserves His love like anybody else. Uh, anybody who has been a member of my churches, you know, at any time know that I think we should be involved in our communities, that we should love the least of these. Um, it was a church that loved this homeless teenage boy that changed my life. Mm. And so I've always said we as a church need to be involved in our community, whether we are helping fight homelessness, whether we are you know, doing what we can to support those people who are engaged in combating human trafficking, mm -hmm. uh, whether you know, our, our church is actively involved in distributing food throughout COVID to people to help them throughout their difficulties. We're helping provide counseling for people who are struggling with finding their new life path, whatever we can do, if, if there is a need, we have the ability to meet that need, then we believe we're called of God to meet that need, to love people, even if it's challenging, even if it, it requires a sacrifice. Um, it, it just it drives my ministry of showing God's love in a practical way. Um, and whether they want to accept it or, you know, accept him or not, we're going to love them. Mm. And then through those opportunities, of course, we see by ministering to people the way Christ did that we can reach reach people through that same same way so yeah, yeah it, it drives uh, a lot of what i do joe and adele i called them mom and dad i still call them mom and dad uh, we do keep in in regular touch in fact just before covid hit actually when covid hit we were actually on a spring break vacation as a family in florida we made sure we got together with uh, mom and dad and preston and my wife and my son the six of us got together there at mom and dad's home to kind of hang out and and connect we keep in touch via texting and phone calls and and stuff whenever we go down to florida i always try to call them up say can we at least go to dinner or lunch can i swing by you know if I'm there for a uh, purpose that I don't have a lot of free time, I try to make an effort to, to stay in touch. So, yeah, yeah, they're very much still staying in touch. The, the daughter, not we weren't as close to begin with, so Karina, we don't stay as close in contact. She lives in Washington State. I don't get to go back and visit there very much. But uh, we need to pray that they can have the eyes of, of Jesus because there is a lot of need in our communities, in their neighborhood, and even amongst their own neighbors. So just begin praying that they will have the eyes of Jesus to see things as Jesus sees them. And when he starts to reveal things, he will start to reveal what's going on in their communities, the needs that are in their communities, the needs of people within the church, needs of, of their own neighbors as they get to know their neighbors. They'll start to see um, that, that there is a need, that there are, and it doesn't have to be a homeless kid who has a need. It could be an elderly neighbor who just needs help with the raking of his leaves or the cleaning of his gutters or, mm -hmm. or something like that. It, mm -hmm. it could be all kinds of things that are around that we have the ability to, to show God's love in a practical way too. Um, they can obviously start exploring the greater needs in the community. I mean, homelessness is real. Um, human trafficking is real. Uh, there are kids in your local elementary and high schools who don't get enough food to eat um, that are low income. For those of us who live in kind of the northern part of the United States, the winters get cold. There's a lot of uh, children in those schools who don't have winter clothing that would love to have a nice used coat. I mean, there's so many needs that if you really want to begin exploring those needs in your community and people would love for someone to help them through that and great organizations you can partner with either individually or as a church that could that could help with that
In fact, I was on a phone call with somebody just the other day who, uh, in D.C., who works for an organization that fights human trafficking. And we were on a Zoom call together, and when I reached out to their organization and this director of this organization to say, we as a church want to help you, um, she was just amazed and shocked and overjoyed that there's a group of people that want to help fight modern day slavery um, in our community. She was just overwhelmed by that. So certainly there's stuff we can do as a church uh, to help people. We don't have to do it all. We don't have to start from scratch. There are wonderful organizations that are doing things to help people and we can come alongside and help them. I mean, she was quite overwhelmed with joy to know that you actually do care about these people. Yes, we do care about these people and we're willing to help.